والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين All praise and thanks belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and may the peace and blessing of Allah be upon his servant and final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam As to what follows my dear respected brothers and sisters in Islam Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh And we are just short of one month from the blessed month of Ramadan and so it is very important as believers that we re refresh our knowledge about the month of Ramadan in order to have our mind and our soul and our heart and our body prepared for this blessed month. I begin with a hadith that would make us appreciate the opportunity Allah Azza wa Jal gives us if He extends our life that we witness another Ramadan. Listen to this hadith. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would mention at the end of it something. But at the very beginning it is a story. Talha ibn Ubaidillah radiyallahu anhu narrated and he said anna rajulayni min bali qadima ala rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Two men from the town of Bali. Bali is a town next to Al-Madina. And they were two Jews. They came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Al-Madinah and they both embraced Islam at the same time. One of them, Allah Azza wa Jal allowed him to go fi jihadin fi sabilillah and he was martyred. And that's how he died. His friend that accepted Islam at the same time died a year later, a natural death on his bed. Talha ibn Ubaidillah radiallahu anhu, he slept one night and he saw a dream. He saw a dream that him and these two people that have accepted Islam, they, were die, they had died now, all of them were outside the door of the paradise, the gate of the paradise, and there was an angel there. So the angel invited the one who died a year later on his bed. He invited him to enter the paradise first. Then the angel invited the one who died as a martyr to enter the paradise second. Then he said to the one who's seeing the dream, Talha ibn Ubaidillah radiallahu anhu, your time is not up because you're still alive. He said to him, go back. So Talha radiallahu anhu woke up from this dream. And he went out in Al-Madina and he began to narrate this dream to the people. فَأُعْجِبُوا min ذَلِكَ The people were amazed and surprised. What are they surprised at? The same thing that you and I are surprised, which is, how did this person who died naturally on his bed enter the paradise before the shaheed? Even though you and I know that the shaheed is a high rank in the sight of Allah Azza wa Jal. So they were bothered by this and they did not understand. They went to the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Talha ibn Ubaidillah radiallahu anhu said, Ya Rasulullah, I saw such and such in my dream. It's a big deal. You know, even nowadays, uh, they make a big deal about who comes first. You know, they might, the entire class might have passed the exam, but it's all about who came first. You might win three, there's uh, the, the race, there's the top three that win the race, but it's all about who came first. Then, Masala, when the iPhone, the new iPhone comes out, it's all about who purchased it first, they will interview him. Don't worry about the second person who had his hand on it. The first person is always something that is where the spotlight is. So when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to them, مِنْ أَيِّ ذَلِكَ تَعْجَبُونَ What are you people amazed and surprised about? They said to him, how did this one go into the paradise before the shaheed? So he said to them, أَوَلَيْسَ قَدْ صَلَّى كَذَا وَكَذَا بَعْدَهُ وَصَامَ بَعْدَهُ رَمَضَانَ Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to them, didn't this person who died on his bed, didn't he pray this many rak'at and prayers worth salat, worth of one year? And didn't he fast a Ramadan more than his friend? They said yes. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said at the end, فَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا أَبْعَدُ مِمَّا بَيْنَ السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ He said, the difference between both of them is the difference between the heavens and the earth. 
Allahu Akbar. What we learn from the hadith is that yes, the first one died amata, but the second one had one year extra of salat, and he witnessed another Ramadan, and that prayers of his combined and his Ramadan pushed him way above the shaheed, Allahu Akbar. So this Ramadan, when you live it, it is a golden opportunity that Allah Azza wa Jal gives you and I to elevate ourselves in his sight, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, لَيْسَ أَحَدٌ أَفْضَلُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ مِنْ مُؤْمِنٍ يُعَمَّرُ فِي الْإِسْلَامِ يَكْفُرُ تَسْبِيحُهُ وَتَكْبِيرُهُ وَتَهْلِيلُهُ وَتَحْمِيدُهُ Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, there is no better than a believer who lives a long life, but this long life is filled with remembrance of Allah azza wa jal, with alhamdulillah, wa subhanallah, wa allahu akbar. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, khayrukum, the best of you, who's the best of us? مَنْ طَالَ عُمُرُهُ وَحَسُنَ عَمَلُهُ the best of you are those who live a long life, living a long life upon goodness and righteousness. And the worst of you are those who live a long life of rebellion, transgression and corruption. We ask Allah Azza wa to save us. So every Ramadan you witness, more than those who passed away from last year until now, is an opportunity for you and I to excel in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Brothers and sisters in Islam, Ramadan in itself is a huge blessing that even the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself would express a lot of happiness and excitement at its arrival. In the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, he says that كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يبشر أصحابه and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to congratulate his companions at the arrival of Ramadan. Ibn Rajab, one of the ulama of Islam, he said this hadith is a fundamental hadith that implies the permissibility of congratulating one another on the occasion of Ramadan. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to congratulate the companions. He used to say to them this. He would say, قَدْ جَاءَكُمْ شَهْرُ Ramadan." He would gather the companions and he would say to them, Ramadan has arrived. You see, the people know Ramadan has arrived. The month after Sha'ban is Ramadan. Why is he telling them Ramadan has arrived? That implies excitement. It's like, let's say there was a person called Muhammad and he's walking from the door. We all know he's Muhammad. But then I shout and I say to you, Muhammad has arrived. Meaning I'm expressing happiness and excitement at his arrival, even though everyone knows who has come. So this is how Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would say to his companions and excite them and gear them all up. He would say, Ramadan has come. Then he would say to them, Shahrun Mubarak. It is a blessed month. What does it mean that Ramadan is a blessed month? It could mean two things. Number one, that it is a dua from the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for the companions that, oh Allah, bless Ramadan for whoever witnesses it. And it's a blessed month because al-barakah means an increase. Barakah means increase. For something to give a lot more than expected. Meaning, if I had a plate of food and it was to feed one person, but two people ate from it, then that plate of food had barakah in it because it gave a lot more than expected. And so the month of Ramadan gives the believer a lot more than he expects from any other month. Because in Ramadan, you read a lot more Qur'an. You fast a lot more than any other month. You make tasbih a lot more than any other month. You pray a lot more than any other month, considering at taraweeh and so on. You come to the masjid a lot more than any other month. Therefore, this month in itself is a barakah. You will find that the deeds increase naturally and automatically. This is because Allah Azza wa Jal has placed barakah in this month. Allahu Akbar. Then he would say to them, كَتَبَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكُمْ صِيَامَهُ Allah Azza wa Jal has obligated upon you all that you fasted. فِيهِ تُفْتَحُ أَبْوَابُ الْجِنَالِ Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is still giving good news. He says to the companions during this month, the gates of the paradise are open. And the paradise has eight gates. Each and every single one of them is open. In another narration, فِيهِ تُفْتَحُ أَبْوَابُ السَّمَاءِ 
the doors of the heavens, the doors of the skies are open. Yani you know what this means? It means every barrier between us and Allah is open. It means Allah wants to accept you in this month. Why would he open the door? He's opening the door, inviting you to the, to the paradise. Why would someone open the door? If you came and knocked on my door and I opened the door, I only open it so I can admit you in it. For when Allah opens the doors and the gates of the paradise, He's inviting us all to the paradise. He's telling you, there you go. There is one month, 30 days. You can score your position in the paradise. Allahu Akbar. Fihi tuftahu abwaabul jinaab. It's like the connection has been established between the earth and the heavens. There's a connection established between us on earth and Allah Azza wa Jal. There is no barrier, nothing is closed between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And further to this, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would say, وَتُغْلَقُ فِيهِ أَبْوَابُ الْجَحِيمِ And the seven doors, the seven gates of the hellfire are shut and they were closed. As though Allah Azza wa Jal is saying, I don't want to punish you, my servants. I don't want you to enter from these doors. I don't want the hellfire for you. Allah Azza wa Jal, he says in the Quran, مَا يَفْعَلُ اللَّهُ بِعَذَابِكُمْ إِنْ شَكَرْتُمْ وَآمَنْتُمْ What does Allah Azza wa Jal get out of punishing you if you only believed in, him, believed in Him and you were grateful to Him? In other words, Allah Azza wa Jal is saying, be grateful and believe in me. And then there is no punishment for this servant. So the doors close. It's a clear message from Allah Azza wa Jal to all his servants. I don't want you entering in this hellfire. And finally he would say, وَتُغَلُّ فِيهِ الشَّيَاطِينَ And the devils are chained. And the effect of the shaytan becomes weak upon the human being. You know, the devils are two types. There is the internal shaytan, which is known as al qareen And there's an external shaytan, the devils that roam around. The external devils are literally chained and they are locked, and they are locked away. But the internal shaytan al qareen remains there even during Ramadan. Then the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said, Inna shaytan la yajri min ibn Adam majra dam. That the shaytan, the qareen that's inside of you, he flows into our body just like blood flows in the body. He's everywhere, in the hands, in the fingertips. He's in the eyes, in the head, in the feet, and he goes all around. That's his evil waswasa, he's at every limb of your body. However, the internal shaitan, his effect is dramatically reduced. And his evil whispering is reduced as well. Because you think of it, when you're fasting, you're hungry and you're thirsty. A person that is hungry and thirsty only thinks about food and drink. What are we going to have for futur? What are we going to eat? And if you smell the smell as well, but that's good. You're thinking of something halal. You're desiring something halal. Al-haram doesn't come to your mind. You don't think of something haram. You're busy with that which is halal. You see, the opposite to a person who's eaten and is filled up, he begins to desire that which is haram. So a shaitan's effect becomes stronger upon him. That's the idea of how the shaitan's whisper is reduced. And so this is how it occurs. Now, then the Prophet wasallam said, after this big distraction, a shaitan is gone, is locked away, the distraction is gone. So you have just you and Allah in your worship. Then the Prophet wasallam said, فِيهِ لَيْلَةٌ خَيْرٌ مِّنْ أَلْفِ شَهْرٍ And there is one night during this month that is better than a thousand months a thousand months of worship. Allahu Akbar. Did you see the barakah in this month? You see the generosity of Allah Azza wa Jal all over this month? There is one night. If you worship Allah in those couple of hours, it is going to boost your record of deeds. A lifetime of hasanat will be added to you. What a deal and what a sale. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said at the end of the hadith, Warning us. Man hurimaha or man hurima khayraha faqad hurim. Anyone who's deprived of the goodness of that night, and the goodness of that night is hasanat and being forgiven. So anyone who's deprived of sin, of, of being forgiven, 
and being granted hasanat and elevated ranks in the sight of Allah, then surely he is deprived of all good. So you see this hadith at the beginning, it starts off with lots of excitement, lots of encouragement, and it ends with terrifying news. It ends with a warning. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying, make sure that you do not deprive yourself of its good. It's very easy to deprive yourself of its good. Just do nothing and turn away from the worship of Allah Azza wa Jal. And this is why Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam cursed. And he said, may Allah humiliate the one who witnesses the month of Ramadan from the beginning to the end. And in the end of it, he is not forgiven. Allahu Akbar. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to grant us all forgiveness and awareness. And this dua was made by Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, Ameen to it. It was made by Allah and Jibreel also said, Ameen. From Allah, from the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, from Jibreel. All three of them curse and may humiliation befall the one who is not forgiven during this month. So there is enough encouragement for us and enough warning at the same time that we take this month seriously. Brothers and sisters in Islam, therefore, it is very important to prepare for this month in order to avoid being disgraced and in order to attain success in the sight of Allah Azza wa And just like with anything in life, in order to be successful, you need to prepare. We all agree to this, right? This is a universal principle. In life, if you want to pass and be successful in your exams, that's a no-brainer. You have to study and you have to prepare for it. If you have a meeting, then you prepare before the meeting. You write an agenda, what is going to be discussed in the meeting and so on. Otherwise, if you come to the meeting and no one has prepared, that, that meeting is going to be a waste of time and you will gain no benefit. In a job interview, you must prepare as well. You get up early, you dress in the best of clothing, you prepare your papers and your documents, and you go. Preparation in order to have a chance at being successful. Even in matters of worship, we have to also prepare. That's why a salat, we make wudu, we come to the masjid early, we repeat after the mu'addin, we pray the sunnah, then the fard. Whether you knew it or not, all of that was preparation for the fard. So that you can achieve maximum khushu'ah. And if you achieved maximum khushu'ah, you became successful in your salat. Even al-hajj. Allah Azza wa Jal specifically in the Quran says, what is a wadu? Prepare yourself. And the best preparation is the preparation of a taqwa. That's what Allah Azza wa Jal said about al-hajj. Even in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Before he met Allah during Laylat al-Isra wal-Mi'raj, you know what happened? Jibreel came to him and cut him open, took his heart out, washed it with a zamzam, filled it with knowledge and light. What was all that? That's in preparation to meet Allah Azza wa Jal. You see the idea? You need to prepare. It's all preparation. Our main problem today is that we don't prepare for our worships. We prepare for everything except our worship. And then we complain. Why am I not connecting with the worship? Why can I not feel a connection with my worship and with Allah Azza wa Jal? The answer is very simple, because you haven't prepared for it. We want to pray the fard right away. We want to fast Ramadan right away from the day one until the end, and that's it. We don't want anything to do before that, anything to do after that. That's the state of the majority of the Muslims. And this is why Sha'ban, which is the month that we have just begun, we're in the second or third day of this Sha'ban, which is one month before Ramadan. Whether you knew or not, you all know now that the month of Sha'ban now is the month of preparation for Ramadan. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam emphasized and highlighted the importance of this month that we are in now. You know, there are some people, as we come closer to Ramadan, they kick back. They sit, they relax, we're waiting for Ramadan to begin. So they do their shopping, they start preparing for a month of, they start preparing, purchasing food, overloading the fridge and the cupboards and whatever it is, in preparation of a month that has nothing to do with food. 
And this is the preparation. Well, unfortunately, this is not the correct preparation for Ramadan. Sha'ban, this month that we're in, I tell you something. It's the month al ulama considered it like the sunnah before the fard. You know, before you come, before, for example, before you pray Salat al-Fajr, it's recommended you pray two rak'at sunnah, then the fard. Tayyib, Ramadan, 30 days is the fard. Sha'ban, the month before it, is actually the sunnah before the fard. And so what should we be doing in Sha'ban? You should be doing exactly what is done in Ramadan. What is done in Ramadan? Fasting, reading Quran, night prayers. Sha'ban, this month, is actually known as Shahrul Qurra. It's known as the month of the recitation of the Quran, just like Ramadan. As Salaf rahimahumullah, they used to close Yughliqu Hanutahu. He used to close his store, his shops, and they used to begin to recite the Quran in abundance. This is when in the month of Sha'ban. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to fast the month of Sha'ban. Kana yasubu Sha'bana illa qalila. He used to fast at all except a few days. Maybe he broke his fast one or two days of Sha'ban. So he fasts 28 days of Sha'ban, breaks his fast to in preparation for Ramadan. And then Sha'ban also is, an, is a month known for its night prayers as well. The believers pray the nights. You see, the exact same things that are done in Ramadan should also be done in Sha'ban. That's how the believer prepares. Now, so, you know, those that don't prepare, and don't see the significance of Sha'ban, what happens? Uh, especially people that never fast, and they used to their coffee in the mornings, the first day of Ramadan, big headache, vomiting, Hada, do all this, vomit and headaches, here now in this month. You prepare now, get over and done with that, so that when Ramadan begins from day one, you're already used to this, and you're going into the month nice and smooth, and you're taking advantage of the first day of Ramadan, right? So this is why preparation is very important. Brothers and sisters in Islam, when we approach Ramadan, we have to have the correct attitude. The mindset needs to be correct. And the greatest attitude that you, you and I are supposed to have is this. Listen very carefully. The attitude we're supposed to instill within ourselves from now is to approach Ramadan as though it's our last Ramadan we will ever witness on earth. And that's if Allah gave us life until we live its first days. That's the attitude. When you approach Ramadan with this attitude, and that could be the case. It could be the, it could be the case that this Ramadan is your last one if you lived through it. If you approach it in this manner, the feeling that that creates within you is a feeling of panic and urgency. You will begin to, to panic and feel urgency that if this is my last one, I need to take advantage to the best of my ability. Right? This is what it does. And this is why in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he once said to a companion advising him, إِذَا قُمْتَ إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ فَصَلِّ صَلَاةَ مُوَدِّعَ He said to him, if you get up to establish the prayer, pray it as though it's your last salat. Brothers and sisters in Islam, if you got up now, and you most definitely knew that Al-Isha tonight is your last prayer. How would that Salat be? Most definitely it will be different than every other Salat that you have prayed. You'll take your time in it. Will khushu'a, will recitation, will prolong the ruku'a, will sujood. I'm going to die after it. Yani, what else do I need from this worldly life other than this perfect Salat I can offer to Allah Azza wa Jal? That's the same attitude you should have with every Ramadan. This could be your last Ramadan. And as the days move, they go really quick. So take advantage from day one and day two, all of a sudden, 10 days are gone, 20 days are gone. The month is finished, the Eid arrives. So this is the attitude that you're supposed to approach Ramadan. So this year, if Allah Ta'ala, if Allah Azza wa Jal allows us and gives us an opportunity to witness Ramadan, we want to do Siyam al the fasting of the farewelling person. And we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to, to grant us this understanding. Brothers and sisters in Islam, I share with you some practical matters in how one prepares for this blessed month strategies. Number one, and above the list, after now you have set your focus and attitude right, this is your last Ramadan. The first thing you want to start doing now in this month of Sha'ban in preparation for Ramadan, 
Number one, no doubt, seeking forgiveness and repenting to Allah Azza wa Jal. Ask Allah Azza wa Jal for forgiveness for all the past sins of yours, the major and the minor, the intentional sins and the mis accidental mistakes, your shortcomings in the worships as well. These are sins that also need istighfar. The diseases and the sicknesses of the heart, jealousy and hypocrisy. Yes. And then now if I said, who can stand up and say, I don't have any jealousy and hypocrisy in my heart, wallahi 100%. No one will dare to do it. Give you even Umar radiallahu anhu didn't dare. Right? And he wanted to know if his name was on the list of the munafiqeen or not. Right? Even though there's, there's a difference of opinion concerning this story. But the idea is, no one will dare. If you're concerned in your relationship with Allah, no one will dare to say, I'm free of hypocrisy. So when you make istighfar, seek istighfar from the sickness and the disease of the heart. Oh Allah, forgive any nifaq that is in my heart. Purify my heart from, from nifaq, from jealousy, from hatred, from envy, from hypocrisy, from all the sicknesses and the diseases of the heart. Turn to Allah with, humi with humility, hoping for His mercy and fearing His punishment. Wallahi, the most successful people in Ramadan are those who enter this month having repented from all their sins. And the greatest word that comes out of your mouth with a sincere heart is astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayh pairing between al istighfar wa tawbah two together wallah brothers and sisters in islam one astaghfirullah that comes from a remorseful heart from a sincere honest heart moments before adhan al fajr one astaghfirullah is enough to destroy mountains and mountains of sins you have done and accumulated one is enough. And especially before Salat al-Fajr, that is a time that Allah Azza wa Jal specifically mentioned that it is time exclusive for istighfar. He said, وَالْمُسْتَغْفِرِينَ بِالْأَسْحَارِ From the qualities of true believers is that they seek Allah's forgiveness at the ashar time, the suhoor time, before Fajr. Because that time is unlike any other time. Because whoever gets up before Fajr, then that time was a time of sleep and rest. People are sleeping and resting. It's not a time to take children to school. It's not a time to eat. It is not a time to engage in any worldly business. It's not a time to take phone calls and respond to emails, nothing. So whoever got up can only have got up for Allah, nothing else. And it makes your intention a lot more easier. And you stand at night and there's no distraction. And you say, Astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayh al istighfar. This will do wonders in your life. Allahu Akbar. And so, this is the best way to prepare for this month. Seek forgiveness in abundance. Ask Allah during the day and the night to forgive you. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to seek Allah's forgiveness a hundred, more than a hundred times a day. And in addition to this, Allah loves those who seek His forgiveness. Allah said, Wallahu yuh, inna Allah yuhibbu tawwabeen. Allah loves those who frequently make tawbah. That's what tawwabin means. Can you imagine this? You know, there were some of the salaf of our pious predecessors. They used to say, how am I going to make sure that Allah loves me? Allah says, Wallahu yuhibbul muttaqeen. He loves al-muttaqeen. I'm far away from taqwa. Wallah azza wa jal yuhibbul muhsineen. Muhsineen, and I'm very far away from muhsineen. Do I have any chance? Do I have any hope? Until he read the ayah, قوله تعالى إن الله يحب التوابين And everyone could be a tawab. Everyone could be a tawab. Everyone could be a person that turns to Allah Azza wa Jal. It requires from you sincere effort and continuously saying astaghfirullah, internalizing its meaning. Saying Allahumma inni atubu ilayk. Thinking about your sins and your wrongdoings. So this is the best way we're going to prepare for Ramadan. Your sins are the biggest barrier and block between you and Allah Azza wa Jal. When you seek istighfar, these blocks, these barriers are moved away and you're on a highway in your relationship with Allah Azza wa Jal. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he used to say, it is a must that every breath the sleeve of Allah Azza wa Jal takes, every breath you take in, he should praise Allah Azza wa Jal with it. And every time you exhale, you breathe out, 
you should seek Allah Azzawajal's forgiveness. And he said, and what he was trying to say is that your life should be between praising Allah Azzawajal and seeking his forgiveness. Praising Allah Azzawajal would mean that you implement the commands of Allah Azzawajal. That's a form of praising Allah Azzawajal. When we get up and we pray, that is us praising Allah physically. When you give sadaqat or zakat, that is you praising Allah Azzawajal because you're implementing what he said. And istighfar is you keeping away from the prohibitions and also seeking forgiveness from that which you have fallen into of those prohibitions. That's number one. Number two in how you prepare for this blessed month of Ramadan, listen very carefully, is by reconciling with your Muslim brothers and sisters that you have hurt and harmed and boycotted and cut ties with, especially relatives and family members. Because one of the greatest gifts of Ramadan is that Allah forgives our sins. That's one of the greatest gifts. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever fasts Ramadan out of faith and seeking Allah's reward, Allah forgives him for all his sins. He said again, whoever prays the nights of Ramadan out of Iman and seeking reward from Allah, Allah forgives him for his sins. Whoever prays Laylatul Qadr out of Iman seeking Allah's forgiveness, uh, seeking reward from Allah, Allah forgives his sins. The entire month is all about forgiveness. The biggest prize is forgiveness. And you know the last 10 days, what's the dua that is to be said in the last 10 days? Uh, what's the dua that recommended? Allahumma innaka afu, tuhibbul afu, fa'fu anni. It's all about forgiveness. Right? And that is the frequent dua that you're supposed to make throughout the last 10 nights. Because the grand gift in Ramadan is all about forgiveness. And the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that two people that are in conflict with one another and hold grudges and hatred to one another and have boycotted one another, they are not granted forgiveness until they reconcile with one another. So if you don't take this matter seriously, to reconcile with those who you have cut ties with and mend it, you risk going through the entire month of Ramadan and your record is held back and forgiveness is held back from such a person. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu was asked, Ibn Mas'ud, a companion of Rasulullah, he was asked, كَيْفَ كُنْتُمْ تَسْتَقْبِلُونَ Ramadan? How did you companions used to welcome Ramadan? How did you welcome Ramadan? You know what he said? This is an answer from people that lived with the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, مَا كَانَ أَحَدُنَا يَجْرَأُ عَلَىٰ أَنْ يَسْتَقْبِلَ الْهِلَالِ وَفِي قَلْبِهِ ذَرَّةُ حِقْدٍ عَلَىٰ أَخِيهِ He said, none of us would dare, شوف يوف dare, none of us would dare to hold an atom's weight of hatred or enmity or jealousy towards another Muslim right at the doors of Ramadan. That's how we would welcome Ramadan. Not with uh, celebrations and balloons. and no, We used to clean and cleanse the heart from anything of friction between the believers. And sometimes I know situations are difficult. Oppression and injustice that it's happening is different. Someone might be sitting and say, but you don't, this guy's got no clue what has happened between someone else that has abused me and slandered me and done every kind of deed you can think. How am I going to forgive such a person? This is between you and Allah Azza wa Jal. This is between you and Allah Azza wa Jal. But Islam always encourages forgiveness. The one who forgives, his reward is immense. It's upon Allah Azza wa Jal on the Day of Judgment. And no doubt. If the oppression is huge and you don't want to forgive, you have the right as well. You have the right. And on the Day of Judgment, you'll receive reward according to that oppression that happened to you. And I give you a story about a sheikh of mine. And I like this story and I wanted to share it with you. Sheikh, been teaching for many years. He was my teacher from when I was 18 years old until this very day. He shared with us this story. He said that once he was in the masjid, and an issue happened between him and one of the elderly people that come to the masjid. The shaykh was in complete right, he had done nothing wrong. This elderly man misunderstood and he was يعني, disturbed by what had happened and he walked off, walked away from the masjid. So the shaykh 
being a sheikh, teaching his students that we need to reconcile and mend and fix things. Go and follow him and see what he needs and what he wants. La, khalas, the person has shut his door, doesn't want anything to do with that masjid ever again with the sheikh, doesn't want to come. One month, two months, three months went by. One year went by, they're offering him whatever. He doesn't care, doesn't want to come anymore. Oof. So the sheikh, our sheikh, went to his sheikh and said to him, this is what has happened. What do we do? Now the sheikh said to him, Allah, this is difficult. But I, all I know is I can tell you one thing. He said to him, if that man, that elderly man, ended up in the hellfire, it would be because of you. And you would be the reason for why he enters. Because he's oppressed you and he's cut the relationship with you. So I don't know how to fix this up. But all I know is if he ends up in the hellfire, it's because of you. This was huge upon the sheikh. He's saying, how? We are people. We want to be the reason for why people enter the paradise. Not the reason for why people enter the hellfire. So it grew in the heart of a sheikh. And he had to do everything to solve it and mend it. One second, and this was after two years. He himself went down to this person. I mean, what do you want? He didn't want to talk to him. He sent his students. Eventually, this elderly man said, I want the sheikh to get up in the masjid and publicly apologize to me. Sure, the sheikh has done nothing. It's very difficult. Wait, yes. you're going to break that or not for the sake of the relationship with your Muftsam brother? So anyway, sheikh, he said it was heavy upon me. But I got up after al Isha and I made a public apology. And they took that public apology, they went to him and they said, Khalas, Alhamdulillah, he apologized. He said, La, apologize after Salat al Jumu'ah. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> so they came back to the Shaykh, he said, Allah, he wants a public apology after Salat al Jumu'ah. And the Shaykh, subhanAllah, he said, Because I did it the first time, it made it easier to do it the second time. So after Salat al Jumu'ah, he publicly apologized. Then what? He hasn't done anything wrong. And then they mended the relationship. Just for the sake of, I don't want to come on the day of judgment, being the reason for why someone enters, enters the, the hellfire. We are people, we want to be the reason for why people enter the paradise. And it was sorted. So the idea is, yes, it's tough, it's difficult. But this is a bond that Allah Azza wa Jal created the belief, between the believers. إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً وَاللَّهُ Azza wa Jal, he forbid that a person boycott his Muslim brother for over three days. It is not allowed. You know why? You know why it's not allowed? Because when people boycott others, most likely it's for worldly matters. He took some money. He took a car I wanted to buy. He married a woman I was supposed to marry. It's for worldly things. Worldly things. And if the boycotting goes beyond three days, that means you have preferred this worthless dunya to something which Allah Azza wa Jal established as a bond between you and others, and that is brotherhood. You've preferred this over what Allah Azza wa Jal has commanded. Therefore, it was haram to extend and go beyond three days. You want to be upset, you want to boycott, do whatever you want within three days. After that, fix it up. Sort it out somehow. Now, sometimes you might have your door open, but it's the other brother, he doesn't want to get, no, no problems, you have no issue upon you. If the other one doesn't want to engage in the process of reconciliation and work things out, so long as your door's open and you're open, Alhamdulillah, there's no issue upon you. Now, number three, we prepare for this blessed month of Ramadan through a dua. Salaf rahimahumullah, they used to make dua to Allah six months before Ramadan. Not hala, two, three weeks before Ramadan, six months. So imagine how much more their dua would intensify as they would approach Ramadan. And this is a preparation. I tell you, it's a preparation. You know, anyone who has a great concern about something will make plenty of dua. And either when you're sick, or if you have a sick relative, or you're going through some intense calamity, you make dua. Right? When you apply for a job and you want it badly, you make dua. Whatever it is that you want and you have great concern for, you make dua. So a sign that you actually have Ramadan at your greatest concern, you will make dua and you will make an abundance of dua. And you see, at the end of the day, Ramadan is a month of worship. And we cannot do any act of worship if Allah Azza wa Jal doesn't give us the strength and the ability to do so. You know that? Allah Azza wa Jal, He says, مَا أَصَابَكَ مِنْ حَسَنَةَ فَمِنَ اللَّهِ Any good you do, 
then that came from Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah Azza wa Jal, he says that the people of the paradise, when they enter the paradise, they will see. وَقَالُوا الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الَّذِي هَدَانَا لِهَذَا وَمَا كُنَّا لِنَهْتَدِي لَوْلَا أَنْ هَدَانَ اللَّهِ وَمَا كُنَّا لِنَهْتَدِي لَوْلَا أَنْ هَدَانَ اللَّهِ The people of the paradise, when they enter, they will say, we would have never been guided if Allah did not guide us to Islam. Therefore, what does that mean? Therefore, what that means is every single good deed and worship you do, it's only because Allah gave you strength and ability to do it. Otherwise, what's the difference between you and people that don't pray? The simple difference is that Allah gave you the strength, the ability. They were deprived of the strength and ability. For what reason? Allahu Alam. That's the difference. Right? Even, even now, sitting here giving a lecture, this only happens by Allah's permission. And even this is mentioned in the Quran when Allah Azza wa Jal said about Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, وَدَاعِيًا إِلَى اللَّهِ بِإِذْنِهِ You only preach and call to Allah by His permission. You can't do anything of the worship without the permission of Allah. And this is why in Surah Al-Fatiha, what do we say? إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدْ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدْ meaning you alone we worship. Yeah, but worship, how are you going to achieve that? وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ We're going to seek your help. نَسْتَعِينَ means we're going to seek your help alone. So إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدْ is the purpose of life. إِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ is the means to get to that purpose. Meaning the only way we can worship is by continuously seeking your help. And this is why the most repeated dua, which comes in the most noble of deeds, as salat is ihdin as salat al mustaqim Guide us to the straight path. You finish the first rak'ah again, guide us to the straight path. Hala, you just said it. Again in the first rak'ah, not even a minute later, ihdin as salat al mustaqim And then the guidance will quickly go. It's like water. You have to keep drinking. It doesn't sit there and rest permanently. It goes like water. You need to be begging for it every time and keep going, going back and back to it. Right. So we seek Allah Azza wa help and we make dua. And from the greatest dua that we make is to say, Allahumma a'inni ala dhikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik. We say things like, Allahumma inni as'aluka fi'l al khayrat. Imagine a Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from his dua, he would say, Oh Allah, I ask you to give me the ability to do good deeds. Now the question is, if he can do good deeds on his own, why is he asking Allah? Meaning he cannot on his own. He needs Allah to give him the ability in order to, to do the good deeds. And from the greatest dhikr that you can say, is to say, لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله. Very important brothers and sisters in Islam. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله means there is no power. There is no hawl. Al hawl is to move from one situation to another. So there is no movement from laziness to action, from kufr to iman, from laziness to strength. I cannot move from laziness to strength in worship, and there is no power illa billah except if Allah granted me that ability. That's what la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah means. This is why when the muaddin makes the adhan, we repeat after the muaddin, right? Whatever he says, we say. When does it change? When he says, Hayya ala salah, Hayya ala al falah. We don't say Hayya ala salah. You know why? He's saying, You come to the salat. So you don't sit there and say, Lala, you come to the salat. He's calling you. Instead, we say, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. In context, you know what that means? He's telling you, Come to the prayer. You're responding, saying, La hawl. Impossible. I can't come to the salat. No way. I don't even have the strength and ability to do so. Illa billah. Except if Allah was to give me the strength, then I'll get up and I'll pray. You see that? And this, la hawla wa la quwata illa billah, you're supposed to be saying after the mu'adhin. Meaning you have to be in the masjid early, way before the iqamah to hear him. So you're here, and most likely you'd be sitting in the front row. You're in the front row, you've come early, you're reciting after the mu'adhin, and even then, you're saying, I can't. I can't come to a salat. Impossible. I don't have the strength. I don't have ability. Illa billah. Allahu Akbar. So that's why Ramadan as well. You don't have the strength to fast and pray and take advantage of its days. Except if Allah is to give you that strength. Therefore, you ask Allah Azza wa for it. Also, how we prepare for the month of Ramadan is by learning about its virtues and reward. It's very important 
to know the virtue and reward. There's plenty of books that speak about the virtue and reward of fasting. I'll tell you something. If I was to tell someone, you say to your child, son, come and cut the grass for me. He's not motivated. Cut the grass, I'll give you $500. He'll jump from where he is to cut the grass because now he knows what the reward is. This is how, this is how mankind is. When they know that there's a pay at the end of the month or the end of the week, they're excited and looking forward to do that work. He'll drag himself to do the work, right? Because there's pay at the end. This is how believers are made. This is how the mankind is made. When we know the reward of something, we're excited to do it. So Ramadan and the worships are no different. This is why there is a huge emphasis in a hadith in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that speak about the virtues of reward, the virtues of deeds, you know? The virtues, al-fada'il, virtue. What's the virtue of saying subhanallah once? Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, you say it once, that's a plant, a, 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 a palm tree in the paradise being planted for you. Huh. Now you know that you're encouraged to say it a hundred times. It's very easy now because I know what the reward is. طيب. So Ramadan, uh, the greatest virtue of Ramadan, firstly is to know that this is the only obligatory fasting of the year. Every other fasting is voluntary. Three days of every month, Monday and Thursday or whatever you want to fast. All of it is what? Is voluntary. Except, of course, the days that you obligate upon yourself. Let's say you woke up and you say, Wallahi, next week I'm going to fast three days. And then that becomes obligatory and you need to fast those three days. But the idea is, Ramadan is the month that is fundamentally obligatory. And Allah Azza wa Jal said, وَمَا تَقَرَّبَ إِلَيَّ عَبْدِي بِشَيْءٍ أَحَبَّ إِلَيَّ مِمَّا افْتَرَضْتُهُ عَلَيْهِ Allah Azza wa Jal, He said, The most beloved things to Allah, that bring the slave closer to Allah are that which he has obligated upon them. So the greatest virtue of fasting, the obligated month of Ramadan, is the closeness to Allah Azza wa Jal. And that is a huge virtue. You know, people in this world of life always seek how are we going to get close to him, especially when people are in higher positions. Higher positions, they have an abundance of wealth. You find people want to always stick close to them and stay behind them, right? Because whoever's big, we come close to him. Maybe we can one day use his services. Right? Even the, 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 the magicians of Fir'aun. Fir'aun, how did he inspire in, and encourage them to continue their magic? You know how? He said, وَإِنَّكُمْ إِذَا لَمِنَ الْمُقَرَّبِينَ if you do what I tell you, I'll bring you close to me. You'll be a part of the inner circle and they're uh, motivated to do the good. We're not saying about a human being. We're saying Allah himself is saying you want to be part of those special selected people of Allah Azza wa Jal. The only way to achieve this is by doing the obligatory deeds and focusing on them more than anything else. That'll bring you close to Allah. Allah Azza wa Jalla said in the Quran, "Kalla la tuti'hu wasjud waqtarib." Allah said, "Come close." You ask, "Ya Rabb, how do I come close to you?" There is nothing that will bring you closer to Allah than what He obligated, and Ramadan is an obligatory month. That's the greatest virtue of it. If you've qualified and become close to Allah, then there is no fee and no worry for such a person. Allahu Akbar. When Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam said. In terms of virtue of the fasting person, he said, For the fasting person, he has two moments of joy. One moment of joy when he breaks his fast, and one moment of joy when he meets his Lord. Okay, so the fasting person, he has two moments of joy. One is a physical enjoyment. What is that? Meaning at the end of the day, once the sun has set and you indulge in some food and drink, that's the worldly joy. That's the joy of the fasting person. Of course, Ibn Rajab, rahimahullah, he said, it is important to note that the physical enjoyment is only given to the one who if, does iftar upon something halal. If a person breaks his fast upon something haram, cigarette, then he does not earn that reward. So we need to be careful. 
You need to be extra careful that you break your fast on that which is halal to earn that joy. And the second enjoyment that the believe or the fasting person has is a spiritual enjoyment. And that is when you meet your Lord. There will be a joy for the believer when he meets his Lord. Why? Firstly, because you're meeting your Creator, Allah, the one who for so long you have worshipped, finally you meet him. And secondly, there's a joy to meet Allah to see the huge amount of reward he has prepared for you because of your fasting and your Quran and your Salat and you want to see what has he stored, what's the purpose, what is there for me? What is the, what's my estate in the paradise? What are my trees? What's my land in the paradise? What kind of reward has Allah put for me? So there is excitement to meet Allah Azza wa to see what he has prepared for you of, 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 of reward. And we learn something very important here that fasting prepares us for the meeting with Allah. Fasting prepares us for the meeting with Allah. And this is why Musa alayhi salam, before he met Allah on the mountain and Allah spoke to him, Allah commanded him to fast 40 nights and also 40 days. So he fasted 40 nights and days straight, ate and drank nothing. Then he spoke to Allah Azza wa on the mountain, teaching you and I, that fasting prepares us to meet with Allah Azza wa Jal. Allahu Akbar. And this is why, did you know that in order for us to prepare ourselves to meet Allah, we should be fasting every day of the year. Just like Musa alayhi fasted, then he met Allah. Did you know? We are supposed to fast every day of the year in order to meet Allah Azza wa Jal. I tell you why and I'll tell you how it's done. We were initially in the paradise, all of us, when Adam alayhi salam was there. Then he ate from the tree. Then we came down to earth as a result of what we ate. So if you want to go back, you have to stop eating. You have to stop eating. So Ramadan was obligated 30 days. After it comes six days of shawwal. Whoever fasts Ramadan and fasts six days of shawwal, he earns the reward as though he's fasted the entire year. That's how he's now prepared to meet Allah Azza wa Jal. So you can literally meet Allah on the Day of Judgment having fasted every day of your life. If you just did month of Ramadan, it was six days of shawwal, they don't have to be next to each other, but six days of shawwal. Allahu Akbar. That's the ticket back to the paradise. Leave that which caused you to come down to this earth. And you know, the strongest desire of the human being is what? What is the greatest desire of the human being? Food, not woman. Food. <laughs> food. Food, like and food. Because you're eating food in the morning, or food an hour later, or food two hours later, or food an hour before, and food at night and before. And I don't know, this is the greatest desire. Ramadan is teaching you how to control the greatest desire you have. And if you can control your desire with food, you can control any other desire because it's less in its intensity than food. That's what Ramadan is training the believers with. Fasting itself, it cleans and purifies the heart. It's a form of repentance. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa he said, fasting three days of every month, tudhibu wahara sadr. It removes the evil traits and the qualities of the heart. So if fasting purifies the heart, hey, that's exactly what you need on the Day of Judgment. You need to show up on the Day of Judgment with a clean, pure heart. That's going to benefit you. Allah Azza wa Jalla, He said, يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ On that day, your wealth, your children will be of no benefit to you. The only benefit would be to come on the Day of Judgment with a qalb that is salim. Salim meaning it's pure, it's undamaged. There's no minor sins on it. There's no shirk on it. There's no innovations. It's clean from all of that. And Ramadan gives you a pure heart. How many minutes do we have after that?
Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Also from the virtues and the merits of fasting Ramadan, and this is found or taken from a beautiful story, and an incident that happened in the time of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There was a man that entered al Madina, and he was poor and he was hungry. So the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came out and it was at night time, and he said to the people of Al-Madinah, who will take this man and entertain him as a guest in his house overnight and feed him and look after him? So one companion said, Ya Rasulullah, I'll do so. I'll take him. So this companion took this poor, hungry person, put him in his house, made food, and it was dark. And this companion made himself as though he was eating, but he wasn't actually eating. So he let the guest eat everything that was in the plate. The guest slept and the day finished. And the next day, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to this companion. And he said to this companion about him and his wife, قَدْ عَجِبَ اللَّهُ مِنْ صَنِيعِكُمَا بِضَيْفِكُمَا اللَّيْلَةِ Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to both of them, Allah is amazed at how both of you treated your guest last night. I tell you this. See this person, him and his wife, they gave up their food and drink for the sake of their guest. One night. And they earned Allah's love. Imagine then the love a person receives when he leaves food and drink, not for anyone's sake, but for the sake of Allah. Not for one day, but for 30 days. How intense would the love of Allah Azzawajal be for such a person? The greatest desire on earth, you left it for the sake of Allah Azzawajal. Such a huge reward involved in this. So don't think that the fasting during the day, oh, like, yeah, Allah, so we have to, we have to fast. And what are we going to do? Have a different approach and think. And I'm preferring what Allah wants from me, which is to give up food, I'm preferring what he wants from me over what I prefer for myself. Now what I prefer for myself is to keep going, eating and drinking. But I want to prefer what Allah wants over what I want. This is exactly what is meant as honesty in your relationship with Allah. Do you know how people sometimes they speak about this concept of be honest with Allah, be sincere with Allah. You know practically, how can one be honest with Allah? When you prefer what he wants over what you want. So for example, when you wake up for Salat al-Fajr, your body wants to sleep, you still want to rest. But you preferred what Allah wants, and that is getting up, making wudu, and praying over what you want, and that is to sleep. 
That is what is meant by your relationship with Allah must be honest. That's honesty in the relationship with Allah. Azzawajal. And perhaps I'll share one last one with you. One of the ways in how we prepare for this month of Ramadan is an important one. You need to understand how to fast correctly. If the greatest pillar of Ramadan is fasting, yeah, because that's the fault. Reading the Quran is recommended, praying at Taraweeh is recommended, feeding the poor is recommended, all the good deeds you know about is all recommended. The one fard and the biggest pillar in Ramadan is to fast its days. So it is very sad if you enter Ramadan and you didn't even know how to fast correctly. And the majority of Muslims don't understand the full complete image of how a person is supposed to fast. And I explain it to you very quickly. You see, fasting is two parts. Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah he said, As-sawm, huwa sawm al-jawarihi an al-atham, wa sawm al-butuni an al-sharabi wa al-ta'am. He said, fasting is the fasting of the stomach from food and drink, and it's also the fasting of the limbs from sins and transgression. A salaf, the pious predecessors, they used to say the easiest fasting is to refrain from drink and food. That's the easy fasting. And the real challenging fasting is to abstain from all forms of sin and transgression. That's the real fasting. And this is why, what is the purpose of fasting anyway? What was its purpose? Allah Azza wa Jalla says, كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامِ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ the entire purpose of starving was to nurture a taqwa. What is a taqwa? A taqwa is to increase in good deeds and to limit and reduce your sins. Therefore, the fasting of the day, the fasting of the day is nurturing taqwa in your heart. You know, a Muslim, a Muslim, even a, a sinner, if I gave him an apple and I said to him, go to that room, no one's going to see you. And it's during the day of Ramadan, eat it. He won't eat it. Why? If I eat it now, Allah is watching and I spoil my fasting. Uh, see that? He's not eating it because he knows Allah is watching. Well, congratulations. That's the same thing that happens during Ramadan, outside of Ramadan, during the morning, during the night, and any time. Allah is always, always watching. So that refraining on food and drink, it's nurturing the heart to lessen in its sins and increase in good deeds. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, in addition to giving up food and drink and sexual relations, he said you need to give up three other things. He said, Man lam yada qawla zur wal amala bih wal jahan falaysa lillahi hajatun fi an yada ta'ama wa sharaba. Whoever doesn't give up false speech, meaning swearing and telling lies, and whoever doesn't give up evil deeds, which is al haram that could be done with the hands and social media, and the eyes and the haram that you see in the ease and the he, the, what you hear that is haram, whoever doesn't give these up, and he doesn't give up ignorance, and ignorance is to not act by what you know. So if you know salat is fard and you don't pray it, that's ignorance. If you don't give up these three things, فَلَيْسَ لِلَّهِ حَاجَةً فِي أَيَّدْعَ طَعَامًا وَالشَّرَابًا Allah Azza wa Jal doesn't need you to give up fasting and, and, and drinking. He doesn't need you to give up food and water. You're better off just going and eating and drinking. So the idea is, this is the correct type of fasting. The fasting of the limbs and the fasting of the stomach as well. We come to the end of our lecture, brothers and sisters in Islam. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal that He grant us life until we witness Ramadan. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to bless our deeds and actions in Ramadan. And we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to accept us, our deeds that we offer to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to grant us sincerity and honesty in our relationship with Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Him subhanahu wa ta'ala to purify our heart and to cleanse us from our sins. And we ask him subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our shortcomings. Innahu liyu thalika wal qadiru alayhi. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Ayyakum. Allahu akbar, Allahu akbar, Allahu akbar, Allahu akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah.